Okay, holy shit. So, the Huffington Post released an article that's completely... Just completely, utterly ridiculous. So much so that they took down the article recently, but luckily I took a few screenshots of the article before it went away. There's also a blog that was written trying to defend the said article, and that's still up, and they recently released another article in response to the backlash that they got, and it's... It's fucking great. Seriously, this is the stupidest thing I've read in a while. All of them are, really. So I'm going to read the entire article titled, Could it be time to deny white men the franchise? Well, with a title like that, I'm utterly shocked that that was received so poorly. This was written by Shelley Garland, which, remember that name, because it's going to be fucking important later. Oh my god, you guys don't even know why that's funny yet. Some of the biggest blows to the progressive cause in the past year have often been due to the votes of white men. If white men were not allowed to vote, it is unlikely that the United Kingdom would be leaving the European Union, it is unlikely that Donald Trump would now be President of the United States, and it is unlikely that the Democratic Alliance would now be governing four of South Africa's biggest cities. If white men no longer had the vote, the progressive cause would be strengthened. It would not be necessary to deny white men indefinitely. The denial of the vote to white men for 20 years, just less than a generation, would go some way to seeing a decline in the influence of reactionary and neoliberal ideology in the world. The influence of reckless white males were one of the primary reasons that led to the Great Recession which began in 2008. This would also strike a blow against toxic white masculinity, one that is long needed. At the same time, a denial of the franchise to white men could see a redistribution of global assets to their rightful owners. Owners. After all, white men have used the imposition of Western legal systems around the world to reinforce modern capitalism. A period of 20 years without white men in the world's parliaments and voting booths will allow legislation to be passed which could see the world's wealth far more equitably shared. The violence of white male wealth and income inequality will be a thing of the past. This redistribution of the world's wealth is long overdue, and it's not just South Africa where white males own a disproportionate amount of wealth. While in South Africa, 90% of the country's land is in the hands of whites. It is safe to assume these are mainly men. This is also the norm in the rest of the world. Namibia, which I hope I'm saying that correctly, has similar statistics with regard to land distribution, and one can assume this holds for other assets too. As Oxfam notes, eight men control as much as wealth as the poorest 50% of the world's population. In the United States, 10% of the population population, nearly all white, own 90% of all assets. It is likely these assets are largely in the hands of males. Although statistics by race are difficult to find from other parts of the world, it is very likely that the majority of the world's assets are in the hands of white males, despite them making less than 10% of the world's population. It is obvious that this violent status quo will not change without a struggle. The only way to do so will be through the expropriation of these various assets and equitably distribute them to those who need them. This will not only make the world a much more equitable place, but will also go some way to paying the debt that white males owe the world. Over the past 500 years, colonialism, slavery, and various aggressive wars and genocides have been due to the actions of white men. Redistributing some of their assets will go some way to paying the historical debt that they owe society. It is no surprise that liberalism and its ideological offshoots of conservatism and libertarianism are the most popular ideologies among white males. These ideologies, with their focus on individuals and individual responsibility, rather than group of affiliation, allow white men to ignore the debt that they owe society, and from acknowledging that most of their assets, wealth, and privilege are the result of theft and violence. It is time to wrestle control of the world back from white males, and the first step will be a temporary restriction of the franchise to them. Some may argue that this is unfair. Let's be clear, it may be unfair, but a moratorium on the franchise for white males for a period of between 20 and 30 years is a small price to pay for the pain inflicted by white males on others. Particularly particularly those with black female identifying bodies. In addition, white men should not be stripped of their other rights, and this withholding of the franchise should only be a temporary measure, as the world rights the wrongs of the past. A withholding of the franchise from white males, along with the passing of legislation in this period to redistribute some of their assets, will also, to a degree, act as the reparations for slavery, colonialism, and apartheid which the world is crying out for to be paid. As we saw in the recent altercation between a white man and Libo Hong Mabuya at a Spur restaurant in Jonasburg, white males still believe that they are in control, and people who aren't white or male, in particularly in particularly black female identifying people, have to bow to their every whim. There are numerous other examples of white angry male violence in South Africa and abroad. 
often against black bodies. Dylan Roof's terrorist actions in the United States is only one of many examples. It is time to wrestle control of the world back from white males, and the first step will be a temporary restriction of the franchise to them. Although this may seem unfair and unjust, allowing white males to continue to call the shots politically and economically following their actions over the past 500 years is the greater injustice. So yeah, this is a no-brainer for why this was received so poorly. It's stupid, it's racist, and it poses complete and utterly ridiculous propositions for how to fix their problems because of white men. I don't need to go much depth about this, I'm mostly showing it for context because you honestly need to listen to this shit to get the full gist of how retarded this entire thing has become. It's completely bullshit in more ways than one. But enough stupid foreshadowing, now I'm going to be reading their defense of the article, yes! Yes, they actually tried defending this. It's titled, This Blog on White Men is Going Viral. Here's our response. This was written by Verashini Pile. sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. On Thursday, the Huffington Post South Africa published a blog by Shelley Garland, an activist and feminist currently completing an MA degree in philosophy. In the blog titled, Could It Be Time to Deny Men the Franchise? Garland talks about how the biggest blows to the progressive cause have often been thanks to white men. On Friday, the blog was picked up by a former senior editor of alt-right Breitbart News in the U.S., who was banned from Twitter over his harassment of actor Leslie Jones. Uh, hang on, we all know who the fuck Milo Yiannopoulos is, so I don't understand why you just didn't say his name. He's a well-known political figure, or at least was. And B, it's funny that you bring up the whole ban from Twitter for harassing Leslie Jones thing, because that was proven to be bullshit time and time again. But it's just funny that you bring up Milo and try to paint him in a negative light to try and get some heat off of you. You know, make yourselves look good in comparison. Nice try, but you fall flat on your fucking face with that one. The Huffington Post South Africa has received an onslaught of messages and comments from those angered by the blog, particularly via our email address inviting corrections from our readers. Here's a small sample. Number one, I see that corrections need to be made on this article. The entire thing is misogynistic and also racist. If you can clear that up for me, that would be great. Number two, congrats Huffington Post, you are now officially the most racist website online. It was hard work, but just look at you now. P.S. Race is a social construct. Number three, delete this article and fire this self-hating racist. Number four, here's a correction. Delete your entire website, you absolute psychopaths. Number five, let's do an experiment. One, copy this article in MS Word. Two, hit Control R and replace white men with any other group, gender, or ethnic background. Three, read the article again. Are you offended? If you are, why are you printing this garbage? Number six, this article is racist towards white men. How can you allow this trash on your site? I've lost respect for HuffPost. Sorry, you are now categorized as junk along with the rest of the SJW trash that seems to persist on the internet. Number seven, I think your editor meant to place this in the satire section of your local equivalent. Otherwise, I say this is a person sympathetic to progressive political causes. I suggest they take a long, hard look in the mirror and ask themselves, what the fuck is wrong with you? Number eight, white monopoly? Tell it to the ancient Egyptians and ancient Chinese. Get over yourselves. Want more black folk? Work harder. Come up with your own economic system. Stop the mouth crap and rebuild a better fucking mousetrap. Number 9. Suck my balls. The world owes you nothing. Well, most of those seem pretty reasonable to me, especially example number five. But then they continue to say, and that's not the worst of it. We've excluded the overtly racist, sexist, and violent comments that are quickly gathering in our inboxes. Garland's underlying analysis about the uneven distribution of wealth and power in the world is a pretty standard for feminist theory. It has been espoused in many different ways by feminist writers and theorists for decades now. In that sense, there was nothing in the article that should have shocked or surprised anybody, or so we thought. It would appear that perhaps such an outcry derives from a very poor reading of the article, or perhaps none at all. Oh yeah, that's the fucking reason why, because people just can't read. Dismantling the patriarchal systems that have brought us to where we are today, a world where power is welded to dangerous and destructive ends by men, and in particular white men, necessarily means a loss of power to those who hold it. A loss of oppressive power. Those who have held undue power granted them by patriarchy must lose it for us to be truly equal. This this seems blindly obvious to us. Yeah, so now you're gonna play the ignorance card, right? Oh, we didn't see anything wrong with the blog, but it's you people who are reading it wrong. Yeah, yeah, you're just reading it wrong, all of you. It's your fault. There's nothing wrong with saying we should take away the basic human right of white men. What's the problem? We're only being endorsed by one of the biggest news outlets in both America and South America. This doesn't necessarily mean we agree or endorse everything in Garland's blog. The point of our voices section is to invite a wide array of voices and views. We hope, as reads continue 
continue to rack up on this blog, that those who are tempted to fire off an angry email to us first engage with the underlying analysis in Garland's blog. Oh, okay, so you don't endorse it. You just kept the article up for a long time and wrote an article defending those types of harmful opinions and silencing detractors of it. But you know, you don't endorse it. Of course you don't. Makes me laugh that you say you invite a wide array of voices and views. Unless they're the ideas that you don't agree with or go against your rhetoric, right? You're pretty fucking comfortable not inviting them to the party, aren't you? What a fucking joke. And you know what's funny? Like I said at the beginning, they took down Shelley Garland's blog and actually published an apology. Because the real kicker of this entire thing is the fact that apparently Shelley Garland doesn't exist. Yeah, it turns out that the first article was a load of horse shit that someone just submitted on a fake account and the Huffington Post just ran with it. They ran with it and then defended it, not knowing they were being played the entire time. Don't believe me? Well, this comes from us from the same woman who wrote the previous blog defending Shelley's blog. Huffington Post South Africa has removed the blog. Could it be time to deny white men the franchise published on our voices section on April 13th, 2017? We have done this because the blog submission from an individual who called herself Shelley Garland, who claimed to be an MA student at UCT, cannot be traced and appears not to exist. We have immediately bolstered and strengthened our blogging procedures that, until now, have operated on the basis of open communication and good faith. From now on, bloggers will have to verify themselves. We hold discussions on putting in place even better quality controls. In addition, we note the commentary on the content of the blog post and will submit it to the South African Press Ombudsman Joe Tholio for his analysis of the opinion we carry. Open to Post South Africa stands aligned to the constitutional values of South Africa, particularly the preamble of our constitution which states that, we the people of South Africa believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We further understand that universal enfranchisement allowed a long struggle and we fully support this. In addition, Huffington Post South Africa is a signatory to and supporter of the South Africa Press Code. We support free expression as limited by the following value as set out in that code. Discrimination and hate speech. Except where it is strictly relevant to the matter reported and it is in the public interest to do so, the media shall avoid discriminatory or denigr or denigratory references to people's race, gender, sex, pregnancy, martial status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth or other status. Nor shall it refer to people's status in prejudicial or pejorative context. The media has the right and indeed the duty to report and comment on all matters of legitimate public interest. The media has the right and indeed the duty to report and comment on all matters of legitimate public interest. This right and duty must, however, be balanced balanced against the obligation to not publish material that amounts to propaganda for war, incitement of immediate violence, or advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender, or religion, and that constitutes incitement to cause harm. We apologize for the oversight. We welcome further discussion. Please email blogs at huffpostsa.com. I mean, this was written from the same woman in South Africa who's editor-in-chief fucking oops. I found this article that was written on heatstreet.com that has more details on this, and I'll link it in the description below, but there's one part of this article that I wanted to read that actually puts a lot of shit into perspective. A person claiming to be Shelley Garland has since reached out to Cliff Central with evidence of the original pitch email she has sent to Huffington Post. Shelley says she received the website's content guidelines, which her piece certainly does not adhere to despite the site's decision to post it. Further documentation from Shelley elaborates on how she conducted the ruse armed with a heavily photoshopped image taken from the internet and phrases employed by the less sensible left. The hoaxer says that the editors at Huffington Post did not correct any of the false claims, factual errors, and logical fallacies she purposefully embedded in the piece and accepted it without question. Wow. So the Huffington Post is just filled with morons then, huh? Seriously, if you guys do zero homework on your own goddamn website, you got played like a fucking fiddle and now every Everyone's laughing at you. Hope it feels good, Huffington Post. I really hope it does. I mean, this isn't the first time you've written shit that's completely fucking stupid. But the fact that you got played by an anonymous source and that you uploaded an article that went against your guidelines is just amazing to me. But hey, maybe one day you'll learn Huffington Post. Someday, maybe. But probably not very soon.